Uh, Joe, thank you very much. Um, for somebody like myself who's in the humanities, I'm an art historian in theory at least, um, these series of lectures, seminars, days are incredibly valuable. I, I like to keep a toehold in the sciences, so thank you to St Cross, thank you for Joanna, and thank you for this series and the quality of speakers that it, it attracts is, is deeply impressive. Um, I'm Emeritus Professor of History of Art at Trinity College. Uh, for a dozen year, more years I wrote a, a column in Nature on science and culture. Um, they still send me free copies, they haven't caught up on the fact I'm no longer a columnist. And the, the percentage of articles that are understandable for me have plummeted very, very dramatically. So many acronyms and so much data and I really struggle with nature these days in a way in which I didn't. The first speaker is Philip Hawkey, Durham University, Order and Chaos in Ancient Greco-Roman Philosophical Imagination. Philip. Hello, good morning. Um, I should preface by mentioning I'm a classicist. Uh, I also work on the history of ancient philosophy. And so um, my physics knowledge went as far as the equivalent in the US system to A-level. Um, so you're, you're going to have to deal with the fact that I am not a, a trained physicist or, or someone who has a, a deeper knowledge of the natural sciences. However, I do know something about uh, ancient Greece and Rome, and I'll talk primarily about ancient Greece today rather than ancient Rome. I don't have time really to get into ancient Rome, but I'll talk about Greece primarily. So in today's presentation, I would like to discuss the origins of the concepts of order and disorder in ancient Western world. I will do so by examining a few key works of classical Greek literature and philosophy, namely Hesiod's Theogony, and the fra fragments and testimonies of Pythagoras and the early Pythagorean Philolaus of Croton. How many, just a quick question, how many of you have ever heard of Philolaus of Croton? One or two, this is great. Okay, so we, we actually have, this is one of the most important uh, figures in the history of ancient cosmology. <clears throat> Hence the time period is roughly from the late eighth century BCE, the period in which Hesiod lived, until the mid fifth century BCE when Philolaus lived. This paper will focus on one type of cosmogonic mode, which has repercussions for the ways in which order and disorder are conceptualized. I, I refer to this mode as the biomorphic by biomorphic, I mean a cosmogonic mode that's based on or analogous to the processes of animal generation, especially the procreation of human beings. There are two other modes of cosmogonic creation popular in ancient Greece and Rome, which I won't have time to present sufficiently today due to time constraints, and those are the stochasmorphic and the technomorphic, which you can see on the slide. This paper will focus on two concepts of salience to modern theories of cosmology. I hope they're of salience to modern theories of cosmology. They are chaos and cosmos. It will emerge in the course of this presentation that in classical Greece, far from being its opposite, chaos is a fundamental element of cosmos and is associated with disorder only in derivative and circumstantial ways. The opposite of cosmos is another term that has not featured much in the history of ancient physics, namely akosmia, which literally means absence or privation of order. An ancient history of disorder qua acosmia remains to be undertaken by scholars. I won't pursue this today. I want to preface my presentation by noting that it's a curious feature of modernity that we persist in using the word chaos to refer to a force or state of disorder per se. The presentation of chaos as a force or state of disorder or a tendency towards disorder is actually owed to the Roman poet Ovid whose Metamorphoses was published around seven centuries after the first appearance of chaos in Hesiod's Theogony. I won't have time to discuss all of it, but maybe in the questions we can get to it. It's now a well-established view among scholars of the ancient Greek world that the earliest accounts of the primordium, Hesiod's Theogony and sections of Homer and Iliad's Odyssey, were partially influenced by stories passed down in the Near East. Indeed, the genre of the Theogony, that is to say, the account of the birth of the gods, their distinct generations, and their wars was already well established in Babylonian, Egyptian, and Hittite cultures. Hence, Hesiod's Theogony represents a latecomer in the history of the theogonic narratives of the West. Hesiod was a poet from Ascra and Boeotia who was thought to have lived in the late 8th or early 7th centuries BCE. 
His poem, Theogony, written in Epic Examiners, is a kind of narrative catalog of the many generations of the gods with an explicit focus on the story of how the Olympian gods, and notably their patriarch Zeus, rose to power over the previous ruling generation, the Titans. Before turning to a treatment of chaos in the poem, I would like to summarize its contents briefly for those uh, in the audience who may have never read it. Hesiod's Theogony starts with a divine invocation to the muses to aid Hesiod in telling the story of the rise of the Olympians. It turns to a genealogy of the gods, starting with the first four entities to appear. And you can see up here there are Chaos, Earth, Tartarus, and Eros, who were generated ex nihilo. It traces the two families that descend from the first parents, the family of Chaos, which itself is first, first born, I'll return to this later, and the family of Gaia or Earth, whose children include Uranus, which is just Greek for heaven, with whom Gaia mixes or mingles in order to produce the next generation, the Titans, the patriarch of which is Kronos. So we're on this line right here. We've got Gaia, who uh, gives birth to Uranus, right? And then she mates with him to produce all the Titans. Among the first generation of gods, Tartarus is the only one, has only one child, Typhoeus, and Eros has no children. The grandchildren of Gaia, the children of Kronos, are Olympians, the patriarch of which is Zeus. And you can tell how long and complex the, the genealogy is because I didn't even have space to fit the Olympians on here, okay? The grandchildren of Gaia, children of Kronos, are Olympians, the patriarch which, of which is Zeus. He sees his divine genealogy is interrupted by two succession myths. First, the overthrowing of heaven by Kronos, in which heaven, who hated his own children, hid them in a dark hole in the earth, effectively Earth's uterus, until Earth crafted a plan whereby her son Kronos would wait until his father heaven lay upon her and cut off his father's genitals with a sickle from the inside, thereby usurping his father's rule. The second succession myth is similar. Kronos, patriarch of the Titans, learns in an oracle from his grandmother Earth and usurped grandfather Heaven that his own son is fated to overthrow him. Seeking not to replicate his father's mistakes, Kronos swallows his own children in the hopes that, so imprisoned inside himself, they would be prevented from overthrowing him. But Rhea, Kronos' consort and mother to the Olympian gods, decides to trick Kronos and wraps a stone in swaddling clothes, which Kronos unthinkingly eats. For his own part, Kronos' son Zeus is hidden in a cave in Earth, this time for protection, and eventually grows enough to challenge his father Kronos. Zeus calls upon his great uncles, the Cyclopses and the Hundred Handers, whom he frees from their chains. As a gift for their liberation, the Cyclopses bestow upon Zeus the weapons of thunder and lightning. Supported by these figures, Zeus wages war on his father Kronos and the family of Titans, defeating them through the use of lightning and imprisoning them in the furthest depths of the earth, Tartarus. This section of the poem, traditionally referred to the, with the term Titanomachy, is the most cosmological. It explains that the distance between heaven and earth is the same as that covered by a bronze anvil falling for nine days and nine nights and finally arriving on the tenth day. Equally, the distance between earth and the lowest levels of Tartarus, the edge of the underworld, is the same. Assuming no air resistance, that would mean the entire Hesiodic cosmos from heaven through earth down to Tartarus would be roughly 7.3 trillion meters. The poem concludes with Zeus defeating another pretender to the throne, Typhoeus, only son of Tartarus, and a list of goddesses that he bedded, as well as a genealogy of his own children. From this summary of its contents, it's evident that Hesiod's Theogony is a prime example of what I call a biomorphic cosmogony, that is to say, a narrative of the generation of the ordered universe parallel to or based on the model of human procreation. In this sense, it does not substantially differ from its Near Eastern precedents. Now, as I mentioned before, the firstborn of the gods is chaos. This is emphatically stated at the beginning of the poem after Hesiod's long invocation to the muses. Read this out to you in English. You've got the Greek if you know Greek. Tell me them, muses, you who hold the Olympian bodes from the beginning, and say which of them first came to be. Now it was chaos that arose the very first, and thereafter, earth, broad-chested, steadfast, eternal seat of all the mortals who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus, and dim Tartarus in a nook of the wide-pathed ground, and Eros, who is fairest among the gods immortal, loosener of limbs, 
who subdues the mind and sensible thought in the breasts of all the gods, of all men. From chaos were born Erebus and black night, and from night came Aether and day, whom night conceived and bore, fused in love with Erebus. But look now, earth first bore a child equal to herself, starry heaven, to enclose her from all sides, that she might be a steadfast eternal seat for the blessed gods. Hesiod's account of the beginnings of the world is exceptionally efficient, and Hesiod wastes no words. First of all, chaos, whom Hesiod invents, this word occurs nowhere else in, in early Greek poetry, is the most primordial of the gods. It is described only with the term protista, which is actually an adverb, so it's not actually applied to him as an adjective. Chaos's name is neuter, which suggests no sexual differentiation. And for this reason, I refer to chaos with the pronoun, pronoun it. The second god born is Gaia or Earth, although Hesiod implies that she was not generated from the firstborn chaos. For chaos's progeny are clearly listed as Erebus, which means thick darkness, and night, and its grandchildren via Erebus and night's copulation are Aether, which means clear or distinct brightness, and day. Moreover, the family of chaos will never, in the course of the theogony, mix with the family of earth. They're always kept set totally separate. This is pretty much all we hear in the passage about chaos, that it was firstborn and that it had some children and grandchildren. Crucially, there are no epithets or adjectives applied to chaos. To speak in Aristotelian terms, nothing is predicated of chaos. Even the action of generating night and Erebus is not, grammatically speaking, attributed to chaos. The line simply says that they were generated from chaos, ak chaos, and not that it actively gave birth to them. Hence, in this introductory passage, chaos is presented without any distinguishable properties. Hesiod's virtual silence on chaos's attributes elicits the question, what exactly is chaos? We can, to some extent, infer what chaos is by figuring out what he isn't. That is to say, he is not his siblings. It is not its siblings. I keep slipping into the masculine. In the first place, chaos is not earth. What is earth? As Jenny Strauss-Clay, the foremost living authority on Hesiod notes, earth's primary quality is stated proleptically by Hesiod. She is the seat of the gods, or rather she becomes the seat of the gods by giving birth parthenogenetically to heaven, who equal to her gave her boundaries on all sides when mixing with her, thereby rendering her a determinate surface space. Since earth plays the role of the ground where the gods would place their homes, chaos would appear not to be this. Moreover, chaos is not its third-born brother, Tartarus. Not much is said about Tartarus here. We only hear that he's misty or dim, eroenta, and that he occupies a nook, mukoi, in the ground, presumably a gap in the earth, and I'll return to these descriptors of Tartarus later on. As I mentioned in my summary of the Theogony's contents, Tartarus is eventually revealed to be the furthest limit of the Hesiodic cosmos, the place of ultimate darkness where the Titans will be imprisoned and suffer punishment. So chaos is not a dark or eschatological entity. Finally, chaos is not Eros, the most beautiful of the immortals, who produces no heirs, but is the force or power of desire for consummation. It's clear that Hesiod understands Earth, Tartarus, and Eros to influence one another, Tartarus finds his place in the nook on or under the earth, and Eros stimulates earth to mate with her son, heaven, which leads to the establishment of external boundaries around her surface. Given the fact that comparison with its siblings me merely reinforces Chaos's distinctiveness, we might consider how its children help us to determine its qualities. This is the approach taken by David Sedley in an important article published in 2009, where Sedley contends against the consensus view that chaos is a force of disorder and the source of evil in Hesiod's universe. Sedley's approach, which tracks the genetic inheritance of attributes, maximizes the potential of the biomorphic mode. It assumes that all the properties or attributes of the divine children are already genetically present, or at least potentially, in the parent or parents. Since chaos has no parent, we can't determine its properties by examining its mother or father, so we have to examine its children as well as, as its further descendants. As mentioned previously, Hesiod claims that Erebus, or thick darkness, and black night were generated from or out of chaos, ekkaeos. In turn, Erebus copulates with night in order to produce their opposites, aether, or vivid brightness, and day. 
It's clear then that what eventually emerges from chaos is both the opposite's night, its daughter, and day, its granddaughter, and their opposing properties, obscure darkness, its son, and crisp brightness, its grandson. From this perspective, we might think that chaos just is the primordial force of opposition. On this thought, inherent in chaos are the opposing parts of the 24-hour diurnal period, 24 hour diurnal period, day and night, and the core properties that point to their opposition, light and dark. The regular circularity of diurnal time is emphasized later in the Theogony in this passage, which I won't read out, but you have it in front of you. Hesiod's welcoming metaphor of the circuits of day and night highlights the bounds that obtains through their motions along the ecliptic. Day and night are denied co-presence. They cannot be in the house of heaven, perpetually held aloft by Atlas at the same time, but they kindly wish on one another well upon arrival and departure. Hence, we might think with Sedley, who emphasizes the inbred nature of chaos's family line, that chaos is ultimately responsible for the generation of time. And even, as Sedley says, the spatio-temporal dimension. Moreover, according to Sedley, all the attributes of the other children of night, whom I've not yet mentioned, as enumerated elsewhere in the poem, they are hateful doom, black fate, death, blame, painful woe, the lots, the fates, nemesis, deceit, old age, and strife, and then strife's children who are even worse. All this indicates that for Hesiod, according to Sedley, chaos is the ultimate, as he says, source of evil. But I think Sedley's interpretation strains the biomorphic mode of cosmogony and the attendant notion of generic inherit inheritance of properties. Let me explain why. It's clear that Hesiod understands chaos to be capable of producing two entities all by itself, Erebus or darkness and night. It produces the brother and sister parthenogenetically, like earth who herself produces heaven parthenogenetically. It's also implied in both cases of chaos and earth that primordial parthenogenesis requires no force of desire. Rather, it's only after earth has produced heaven parthenogenetically that her brother Eros or desire exercises his power over her so that she commingles with her son heaven to produce the next generation. Chaos does no such thing. It never copulates and hence it is never subjected to its brother Eros's power. Rather, it is its children, Erebus and Night, who find themselves compelled to copulate. And he said is emphatic about this. He speaks of Night being fused in love or blended through desire. It's right, uh, where do they get blended? Right here, philotiti migesa. Hence, it's clear that in the family line of chaos, its daughter Night is the first to be subjected to the power of Eros, which is, as we saw with Earth, the central driver of second order generation of beings, that is, after parthenogenesis. This raises an important question that has, to my knowledge, never been treated by scholars dedicated to explaining this passage. Is it possible that Tartarus, the forgotten other sibling from amongst the first generation of gods, played some role in the generation of the forces of discord? A careful reading of these passages that tracks the attributes passed down suggests just this. For if we examine the section describing the relationship between mother day and daughter night, we see not only that night has been influenced by Eros, as mentioned previously, to give birth to her opposite, day, but also that she features the properties of Tartarus as well. Recall that Tartarus was first described in the poem as dim, eroenta, and in a nook of the wide path ground. Tartarus would seem to be representative of the murkiness or dimness that obtains in places where there is no differentiation, such as the dark abodes at the end of the world where the Titans eventually find themselves imprisoned. How does this relate to night? In line 757, the bottom line here, night is said to be noxious, veiled in a murky cloud, oloe, nefele, in the kekalumene, eroeide. In Sed on Sedley's reading, these qualities would somehow be owed to chaos on the grounds that night was produced parthenogenetically from chaos and could only have received them from her parent, but they're clearly meant to elicit comparisons with her uncle Tartarus. Note the comparison between night being enshrouded in a cloud that is eroeide, this word right here, and Tartarus's primary attribute as eroenta, right there. Hence, it's by virtue of the force that Tartarus exerted somehow over chaos that night and Erebus were generated from it. Consequently, the, fight that, the fact that night and her descendants are creatures of darkness and eventually of conflict and destruction is not owed to her generation from chaos. As no, who, as noted before, is without qualities, but rather to Tartarus's influence over chaos. 
What exactly this influence was can't be clearly, clearly inferred from the text. At any rate, the fact that chaos is not sexually differentiated would help to explain why Tartarus did not mingle with chaos to produce night and Erebus. It might seem that my hypothesis is a stretch, especially since Sedley's argument is so elegant and fits so neatly into a progressive developmental history of thought, and Sedley concludes with Plato's Timaeus. But my hypothesis helps to explain something that remains wanting with regard to our analysis of the first passage of Hesiod's Theogony, the one that's up here. For as I noted briefly, Tartarus is presented in the first instance not only as dim, eruenta, but also in the nook of wide path ground, mukoi chthonos eru o deis. We previously identified the wide path ground with earth. But what about that curious nook, mukoi? I would contend that the nook is precisely Tartarus's sibling, chaos. Chaos emerges from this highly efficient description of Tartarus as the interval between determinate spaces. In, the case, in this case, the spaces of earth that are made determinate externally by heaven. This reading confirms the, confirms the conventional etymology of chaos. Scholars have often assumed that the name chaos, which Hesiod invented, is closely related to the term chasma, which means chasm, and it's from the verb kaskane, to gape or to yawn. This, this interpretation has been controversial, but this isn't the occasion to address the challenges that scholars have brought. Still, the interpretation of chaos as chasm or interval between the determinate spaces receives support in another key passage of Hesiod's Theogony, where the poet vividly reports the end of the Titanomachy. And this is this passage, which I will read because it's really wonderful. No longer would Zeus restrain his ferocity, but now his heart was filled at once with ferocity, and he showed forth all his power. From heaven, from Olympus together, he advanced intrepid, hurling down lightning, and the bolts zigzagged, thick with thunder and lightning alike, from his stout hand, whirling the holy flame recurrent. All around, life-giving earth trembled in flames. All around, the vast forest rattled unspeakably in fire. Every ground, the streams of Okeanus and the barren sea were boiling. The hot blast enshrouded the chthonic titans. The flame touched the heavenly air unspeakably. Though they be strong, the blazing shaft of thunder and lightning bolts shocked them blind. The awful, awful sweltering seized chaos, and it seemed for eyes to see and for ears to hear, just as if earth and wide heaven on high collapsed, for so massive a din would arise from the former crashed upon, the latter crashing down. He says account of the din of war is emphatic and pronounced. He seeks to convey the brutality of battle in the violence of sound. We're witness to nothing less than the imagined capitulation of the cosmos itself. Zeus advances upon the lower world like an army marching forth without pause. His lightning shatters the ears and blinds the eyes of the titans. His power is so diffuse it would seem to anyone observing that he were bringing heaven to collapse upon earth. The mechanism for this wrecking of cosmic order is explicit. The heat produced by Zeus's lightning bolts grips chaos. And without the gap to maintain distance between heaven and earth, there can be no order in the world. Hesiod does not, of course, allow for such a collapse of the world order. It, present, it is presented counterfactually as a thought experiment, mainly because the total destruction of the world order would leave nowhere for the gods of Olympus to take their seat. But this does not invalidate the point within the internal logic of the poem that chaos is figured as a gap or an interval between determinate spaces on earth. Insofar as chaos is a gap or interval, there's no reason to see in it a force of disorder. Rather, qua interval, chaos is actually a maintainer of the world order, without which internal cosmic order and differentiated space could not persist. At this point, I would like to turn away from chaos and focus on the second key term, cosmos, which generally means when used in a cosmological context, world order or well-ordered world. I will start by discussing the emergence of a distinct concept of world order indicated by the term cosmos before turning to the gradual elaboration of the notion in the fifth century BCE. It's important to highlight at this point that the word cosmos did not always mean world order. A semantic analysis of the use of the term cosmos and its correlate verbal and adjectival forms in ancient Greek literature reveals that prior to 550 BCE, the term never means world order in the sense of a universal system of reality. Rather, it just means order in a more mundane and practical sense. And hence, it is misleading to speak, as I have and many scholars do, um, of Hesiod's cosmos. 
Hesiod uses the term pas, an adjective which just means all, as it does in line 127 of the Theogony, where Hesiod speaks of heaven fencing in all of earth. And this is the phrase right here, peri pas on ergoi. By the time of the late 6th century BCE, the term pas or all had been abstracted to a more general notion, the universe, expressed with the neuter singular topan, that's right here. In cosmological context, cosmos is not the preferred term, as topan, the universe, was the go-to metaphor. The Greeks themselves recognized this fact, and from as early as Plato and Xenophon, writing in the first half of the 4th century BCE, there began a collective speculation, which eventually morphed into a debate, about who was the first to discover, sorry, who was for, were the first to refer to the universe, topan, as, and everything in it, with the term cosmos. Several figures were considered, but a consensus emerged that the first person to refer to the ordered universe as cosmos was Pythagoras of Samos. Pythagoras was a philosopher who developed a school of learning in Croton, southern Italy, around 530 BCE. Pythagoras is a controversial figure from a historical point of view, and there's no consensus on the intellectual activities he undertook, but most scholars would agree that Pythagoras engaged in some way in both scientific and moral education. The debate concerning who first used the term cosmos to refer to world order is evidenced by the skeptic philosopher Favorinus, late first to early second century CE, who mentions in a work entitled History of All Sorts that Pythagoras was the first person to refer to the heavens as cosmos. Still, the distinct reference to Earth as round here would imply that Pythagoras did not understand Earth to be part of cosmos, and hence cosmos refers in a restricted sense only to heaven, not to the entirety of reality. This understanding of cosmos is confirmed by another late source, probably from the first century CE, whom scholars call Anonymous Photii. We don't know uh, what this author's name was, um, but we, his text is provided, is preserved in the ninth century CE patriarch pa uh, Photius of Constantinople's writings, and that's why we refer to him as Anonymous Photii. In the course of providing a comprehensive account of Pythagorean philosophy, Anonymous Photii explains that the heavens are called cosmos because they are perfect, by which he means they are adorned, kekos mesthai, with all the living beings, and here he probably means the stars and the fineries. As such, the cosmos is a place for life and beauty, a consequence of, its, of the determinism implicit in its teleology. We cannot be sure on the evidence of these two late sources that correspondent notions of teleology and proper order were assumed in Pythagoras' own use of the term cosmos because Pythagoras left no writings which we could consult in order to confirm or deny this speculation. To gain some ground on this question, we will examine the writings of one important Pythagorean, the philosopher Philolaus of Croton. We know a little bit about Philolaus's life. He was from Croton in, or Tarentum in southern Italy, and Philolaus allegedly fled Croton around 450 BC, along with a number of Pythagoreans who were threatened but with death by local politicians. This might be the first example of politicians uh, tr threatening uh, philosophers with death and getting rid of them as a consequence. As an exile, Philolaus first traveled to Lucania, modern Basilicata in Italy, where he shored up support, and then to Thebes in mainland Greece, where he became the teacher of several notable junior philosophers. His visit to Thebes is portrayed in Plato's dialogue Phaedo, where Socrates conducts a debate with Philolaus' students Simeus and Cebes on the question of whether the soul is immortal. It's generally agreed that Philolaus is the first Pythagorean to have written down his philosophical views in a book. The work, a brief but compelling treatise, which survives only in fragments, was later given the title On Nature, that is to say, Physics. In it, Philolaus, like Hesiod before him, set out to explain the principles of reality, the emergence and transformation of the world, and the structures that underpin the universal order. Philolaus additionally treated of various philosophical and scientific aspects related to these topics, including epistemology, astronomy, embryology, and human psychology. Philolaus also made important discoveries in music theory, where, which he integrated into his cosmological speculation, thus confirming the famous attribution to the Pythagoreans, first attested in Aristotle, of the so-called harmony of the spheres. Philolaus's book begins with a powerful statement about nature and cosmos. You have it in front of you. Nature and the cosmos was fitted together, both out of things which are unlimited, we sometimes call these unlimiteds, and things which are limiting, we call these limited, limiters, both the cosmos as a whole and all the things in it. On the basis of the surviving evidence, scholars are at a loss to determine what the principal entities that make up the cosmos, the limiters and unlimiteds, really are. You can look at this if you try to figure it out for yourself. In the context of the cosmological theory of Hesiod, I would like to advance a novel hypothesis concerning Philolaus' first principles, which to my knowledge has never been advanced. 
For Hesiod, as we recall, earth in the pre-cosmic stage was a sort of matter with extension, but lacking external boundaries. For once heaven mates with earth, she is given boundaries which make it possible for earth to have external differentiation, to become a surface space. If we draw analogies between these two systems, Philolaus's unlimited is referred to what in Hesiod is earth, that is to say the stuffs that have extension but no definition. And his limiteds refer to Hesiod's heaven, that is to say, entities that provide external boundaries to the stuffs. On this reading, Philolaus is not totally innovating within the cosmogonic traditions of ancient Greece, as scholars have often assumed. Instead, he has adapted two principles that he found in Hesiod, earth and heaven, but modified them through demythologization in order to advance a novel cosmogonic theory freed from the accoutrement of divine genealogy. This hypothesis of Philolaus' adaptation of Hesiod's cosmogonic account might sound plausible, at least with reference to earth and heaven, but what about the other two cosmic deities of the first generation in Hesiod? One Hesiodic god with whom, for whom there's no difficulty in detecting a parallel in Philolaus' fragments is Eros. For in On Nature, Philolaus speaks of a force that comes upon the limiters and unlimiteds in just the way Eros influences heaven and earth. That force is called harmony, harmonia, so uh, on this, I'll read this to you, it's an interesting bit. Concerning nature and harmony, the situation is this, the being of things, which is eternal, and nature herself, admit of knowledge that is divine and not human, except that it was impossible for any of the things that are, and that are known by us, to have come to be, if the being of things from which the cosmos came together, both the limiters and the unlimiteds, did not pre-exist. But since these beginnings pre-existed, and were neither alike nor even related, it would have been impossible for them to be ordered if a harmony had not come upon them in whatever way it came to be. So then, like things and things of the same kind did not require any harmony additionally, but things that are unlike being neither of the same kind nor of the same speed, it is necessary that such things be bonded together by harmony if they're going to be held in order. Now, regardless of the many puzzles raised by this fascinating fragment, it's relatively clear that harmony plays the same role that eros, or love-desire, plays in Hesiod's cosmogony. It is the force that compels, one way or another, things that are unlike and of a different kind to bond together in a unity. Without this binding, the ordered universe as we know it could not have been originally ordered. Now, with reference to the limiters, unlimiteds, and harmony in Philolaus, and heaven, earth, and eros in, uh, in Hesiod, the cosmogonies of Hesiod and Philolaus show important correspondences, but this is where the obvious similarities end. Hesiod includes two further entities among his original four, Chaos, whom we identify with primordial gap or interval, and Tartarus, whom we identify with the obscurity of darkness. Neither of these two figures is in any straightforward way paralleled in Philolaus's account, Philolaus's account of the primary uh, separation of the reality. Hence, Philolaus seems to have excluded the forces that one way or another eventuated time and the forces of discord that emerged in the later generations in Hesiod. If, as we speculated previously, Pythagoras was a committed cosmic teleologist, this might have compelled Philolaus to exclude at least the dark force Tartarus, but it wouldn't help to explain the ex apparent exclusion of chaos. Moreover, it would appear that Philolaus has removed the genetic element. Without gods mixing sexually with one another, there is no implication of biomorphic cosmogony. Indeed, it's clear that harmony causes the limiters and unlimiteds to come together, but the metaphor of their mixing is totally desexualized. Still, as I will now argue, this does not imply that Philolaus rejects the biomorphic model of cosmogony. And this becomes evident when we examine the later stage, the next stage of the cosmogony. In another fragment, Philolaus tells us that the first thing fitted together, the one at the center of the sphere, is called hearth. This fragment outlines the beginning of the next step, the second step in Hesiod's cosmogony. It reveals that for Philolaus, the combination of limiters and unlimiteds motivated by harmony produces a sphere, and this first individuated item, the first individuated item in that sphere is a fire located at its center. The fire is called hearth, probably because it was conventional in ancient Greece for the center of the home to feature a hearth to heat it. Indeed, another testimony, which I provide on the slide, uh, clarifies that the fire is called the house of Zeus, in the sense of Zeus's home on Olympus. So the fire at the center of the cosmos, surrounded by the so-called counter-Earth, Earth, Moon, Sun, and five other planets, and the fixed stars of heaven, corresponds to Zeus's home on Olympus. But the domestic metaphor is comp complemented by the biomorphic mode, as we see from a testimony provided by Aristotle's student, Mino. 
This testimony preserved for us in a second century CE papyrus in the collection of the British Library is crucial for understanding Philolaus' cosmogony because it explains by way of analogy how the fire at the center of the cosmos, this right here, interacts with what is outside the sphere in order to catalyze internal articulation. This is the papyrus, which is in the British Library. Philolaus of Croton states that our bodies are constituted out of heat for he says they have no share of cold, suggesting this from the following considerations. The seed is hot, and this is what provides articulation for the living being. And the place into which there is its ejaculation, this is the uterus, is quite hot and resembles it. And what resembles something has the same capacity as that which it resembles. Since that which provides articulation has no share of cold, and the place in which its ejaculation occurs has no share of cold, it's clear that the living being that's articulated, it turns out to be of the same sort, that's to say it has no share of cold. With regards to the arti articulation of the living being, he adds the following consideration. For he says, immediately after birth, the living being breathes in the external air, which is cold. Next, he sends it ba back out again, like a debt. Indeed, it's for this reason that there's a desire for external air, so that our bodies, which were too hot before, by the drawing in of breath from the outside, are cooled thereby. He says, then, that the constitution of our bodies depends on these things. This testimony helps us to conceptualize how the cosmos goes from being a sphere composed of limiters and unlimiteds, brought into correspondence through harmony, to a living being. For like the creature mentioned by Mino, no doubt a human, but possibly other kinds of animals as well, the cosmos features a primary element, the fire, and that element's chief property, the hot. The, the process of insemination of the uterus involves no forces of opposition, since seed and uterus are both hot. Indeed, uterus is hotter than seed. So in the process of generating a fetus, we have like interacting with like, no need for harmony to bring things unlike one another into correspondence. It's only once the infant is born that he breathes in the cold air from outside, thereby catalyzing his internal arrangement and coming into life. We must imagine something similar in the case of the cosmos. At first, the sphere is dominated by the heat generated internally by its fire at the center. But then in order for it to obtain internal articulation and thereby become a living being, Cosmos must, like a newborn baby, breathe in the cool air from the outside, in this case, something like void. And Aristotle confirms this reading in his physics. He says, the Pythagoreans too held that void exists and that it enters the heaven from the infinite breath, the cosmos inhaling also the void which distinguishes the natures of things as if it were what separates and distinguishes these terms of a series. As Aristotle testifies, the proper internal arrangement of the parts of the Pythagorean cosmos can only be made possible through the primordial act of breathing. The cosmos inhales void from the outside, its external boundaries, and this activity cools the sphere internally. The blending of hot and cold is like the blending of limiter and unlimited that produced the sphere in the first place, and we're encouraged to speculate how the recurrence of this blending at every stage of the constitution of reality can be observed. Hence, Philolaus provides a truly systematic, repeatable, and understandable process of world creation that occurs at the level of macrocosm in the world order itself and at the level of the microcosm in the birth of an infant. Hence, we can still speak of a biomorphic mode of, mod, mode of cosmogony. And like Hesiod's cosmogony, where we distinguish primary and secondary stages of cosmogonic development, Philolaus understands the distinction between the initial coming together of the limiters and unlimiteds to establish any order at all, and the subsequent stages of creation that inform the primordium. Both Hesiod and Philolaus detail a progression from cosmogony to cosmology. There's one final consequence that emerges from Philolaus's cosmological account, which helps us to situate it better in relation to Hesiod's theogony. And I conclude with this observation. The introduction of a notion of cosmic breathing reveals another element of Phil Laus's cosmological system that has been hiding just beyond our sight, namely the notion of void. I suggest that Phil Laus's void, which is breathed in from the outside the sphere, corresponds to Hesiod's chaos, insofar as both indicate the spaces or intervals between things that provide regular order. Aristotle takes this idea further, even suggesting that the void breathed in into the Pythagorean cosmos is the same thing that provides systematic order to numbers in a series. Hence, Phil Laus's void, which corresponds to Hesiod's chaos, also reveals itself to be fundamental to the persistence of repeatable order within the cosmos. For two of the most sophisticated early Greek uh, cosmologists, Hesiod and Phil Laus, the existence of chaos or void is revealed to be a necessary condition for the maintenance of the universe, whose nature first prompted humans to wonder at the marvels of reality. Thanks.
I have to skip all that. Uh, Philip, thank you very much. Um, complicated. But it's very good to have such a sure-footed guide through this, uh, through what is a chaos of mythology looking for order. Um, we have some time for some questions. In your quotation from Aristotle, yep. is Aristotle quoting that as something to disagree with, eventually that he will disagree with in a more planistic uh, account? of the world. Absolutely. So Aristotle is very interesting. He hates the concept of chaos, of cosmos. He, he detests it. He associates it with the Pythagoreans particularly and with Plato and he thinks they all get it wrong. He prefers the term uranos, heaven, and um, he, he, he thinks that um, the Pythagoreans get it wrong because they, precisely because they do things like bio, do this biomorphic approach to understanding how the cosmos works. He thinks this is just silliness. Because Aristotle differentiates himself from previous philosophers in thinking that each individual science has its own set of first principles. So the first principles, for example, for biology are going to be completely different than the first principle for cosmology. And so as a consequence, he thinks that uh, drawing illusion or draw, drawing analogies between different types of, of sciences is a fundamental error in scientific learning. So, uh, yes, I think you just answered my question, but in terms of natural philosophy, so would you regard them as natural philosophers? So when they talk about chaos and we're talking about chaos, are we essentially trying to uncover the same thing? I think we aren't. I think, I think um, part of the reason why I, I, I mentioned at the very beginning of the paper that a history of the, the, of the term that we associate with chaos, which is disorder or tendency towards disorder, something like that, um, Th th that, that, co that concept is called aquasmia in ancient Greek. And there's no one who's done a history of aquasmia, including myself. Um, so it, it remains to be done. There's to understand exactly what uh, parameters would, would exist for a discussion of, in order to frame a discussion of the opposite uh, uh, tendency towards order. Um, there's just nothing like, I mean, one of the things I was mentioning earlier in a conversation, it's shocking when you look at antiquity how much, and this isn't just the Greeks, but also the Egyptians and Babylonians, etc., how much they think that everything is going to tend towards the good in the end. And everything is going to end up as a pretty good system. And the reminder of this is every day you wake up, the sun comes up. And, uh, well, in the Northeast it doesn't always come up, but anyway. Uh, um, it, it, is, it, is a, it is surprising how novel I think it must have been for people to begin to think that things tend towards disorder. Yes, in the third row here. Uh, hello. Um, I might have misunderstood, but the, the hearth gives heat to the, the objects in the, uh, the spheres around it, but the, the void is cold. So can the void effectively be thought of as an infinite void of such a low temperature that it's a reservoir that can't be heated by an external source? I mean, look, uh, Hesiod, Hesiod and Phil Laos were not at all aware of things like being able to measure temperature and things like this. I mean, they, 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 there is no, there's no kind of, uh, they don't have, basically they don't have the proper instrumentation to be able to assess such questions. It's interesting to me that one could think that that is a possible reading coming out of Hesiod. That's strange and bizarre, and I, I find it marvelous actually that, that you could think that way, because what people tend to do when they read this is they say, oh look, this is just some mumbo jumbo mythology. But as I tried to show, there's actually a lot of logic and reasoning to what Hesiod's doing, an incredible economy of speech. And um, in antiquity, this was how Hesiod was read. There's a famous uh, anecdote about Epicurus, right, who probably is from antiquity the philosopher <laughs> whose ideas have influenced us the most in many ways. And uh, Epicurus was asked, um, uh, what is the philosophical value of Hesiod's chaos? And his response was kind of, was sort of, was glib. He said, well, what indeed, right? And, and, but actually there's, 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 it shows that in antiquity there was an open question about the extent to which Phil, uh, Hesiod, the first or second author that survives in the Greek corpus, was actually really modeling what we would call something like natural scientific ways of thinking. Yes. Um, in, in modern, sort of scientific parlance, um, chaos doesn't, of course, mean disorder. It, right. It's a highly, you know, mathematically ordered system that gives rise to superficially 
disorder become complex. Superficially chaotic, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I wondered in that sense, are we getting back, cl are we getting closer to um, the ancient Greeks meaning? I'd be that? happy with that. I mean, you know, I, 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 posed, I, posited, I posed it as kind of like a challenge, you know. I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to mention this, but the, the, the passage where um, there's no question that chaos is represented uh, as a kind of force of disorder in the world is this one from Ovid's Metamorphoses. One wouldn't think that the notion of chaos being identified with disorder would be um, something that we would date to a poet, but in fact that's exactly what it is. Uh, as far as we can tell from our surviving uh, evidence from antiquity, it is um, absolutely not a, 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 a kind of notion of disorder until Ovid. And this is the passage, he says, but there was He's talking at the beginning of his poem, and Morphosis says, but before there were sea and lands and sky which covers all things, the face of nature in the world was completely one which they called chaos, a rough and confused mass and nothing but a lifeless weight and warring seeds of things poorly conjoined heap into one. And then he goes on to explain uh, that God comes in and God separates out the parts. And this is what I refer to at the beginning of the lecture as a technomorphic account of cosmogony, so that the God comes in and rationally differentiates things. And I've been interested in, in thinking about the difference between the biomorphic and the technomorphic modes of cosmogony um, in the ancient world. It probably doesn't have much use for today. Biomorphic would just be silly. But, um, but uh, it is curious to me that um, why this kind of took, took hold amongst a certain way of thinking about chaos. Uh, I'm very interested at the moment in the, what's called the Newtonian n-body problem. That's n particles that are interacting with each other. And the, the entire mathematics of it is just separations between the particles. And I was very struck when you were talking about the gap and the limiting. So the particles are the limit and the, and the distance between them is, is the gap. It's very remarkable. And, and it, it, the n-body problem is the, is the great oldest uh, problem in mathematics and physics. Well, now it's even older than you thought it was. Uh, so <laughs> it's, um, look, this is great. So, um, I, I mentioned at some point that, that people have, have speculated about what the, non, the limiters and unlimiteds are. And um, uh, the two famous arguments that are, that are kind of the dominant ones that are out there is that the argument of, of a scholar named uh, Walter Burkert, a fantastic scholar, one of the best scholars of the previous generation. Um, and uh, he argued that the limiters were atoms and the unlimiteds were, were intervals. Uh, and, um, and the problem is that we know that the Pythagoreans, such as Phil Laus, they, they seem to have trained the first person to posit atoms, who was Democritus, but we don't have evidence that they themselves were thinking about atoms. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, 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 a, it's anachronism. We have to be very careful about these kinds of anachronisms. The other argument, it's one from Aristotle, is that actually limiters are odd numbers and unlimiteds are even numbers. <laughs> so, um, and that one is defended by a, a wonderful scholar who's not appeared, Malcolm Schofield. So um, I've gone for an, an argument that's a little bit closer to this Hesiodic version of stuffs versus things that give a border on the outside is actually closer to an argument given by a, a, a wonderful former uh, uh, Oxford scholar, Jonathan Barnes. Uh, and, uh, um, but I, I think it's great that these things are in the air in the first or second text written in the Western tradition. I think if there are no more questions, we'll move on to, to the second speaker. Thank you very much for that. <laughs>